All right, Deuteronomy 33, verse 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also, in, also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thine excellency. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Father, thank you, Lord, that we can be back tonight. Thank you for what we've enjoyed today. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing. Lord, help us again to consider you. And um, Lord, help us to really see you, Lord, in a, in a much better way, a bigger way than we have. And again, we pray that it would linger with us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we talked about uh, this morning, there is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. And I want to continue that thought tonight. Um, you know, there is nobody like our God, um, consider his arm, consider his arm. Look at Jeremiah 32 for just a moment. Jeremiah 32. You know, man was made in the image of God. And you know, in the Bible, you know, God has eyes and ears and and, uh, you know, um, all, all sorts of things, you know, he talks about himself. And um, one of the things he talks about is his arm. Look at Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee, his arm. In Job chapter 40, Job said, Hast thou an arm like God? In Psalm 89, David said, Thou hast a mighty arm. In Psalm 98, it says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. You know, every time you see the arm of the Lord pictured, it's, it's a picture of his strength. Um, Isaiah 51, verse 9 and 10, it says, Awake, O arm of the Lord. In Isaiah 52, it says, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm. And it's talking about his dealing with the nations. You know, we talk about arms. You know, you, you know we think of weapons. We think of an army. And, uh, you know, there is no arm like the Lord's arm. There are no fingers like His. In Psalm 8.3, it says, The heaven and the moon of the stars are the work of His fingers. Now, He, he talks about this stuff all the time and um, throughout the Scriptures, and we talked about it this morning, how big God is, and He really is that way. Um, he made the stars with His fingers. You know, the sun is, you know, and I was going to look it up and I, I didn't get around to it. Um, but you have our earth and I can't remember how many earths fit inside the sun. The sun is one of the smallest stars that they're aware of. It's one of the smallest. But, you know, thousands and thousands of earths fit into the sun. And the sun is a small star. You know, um, there are planets that are thousands and thousand times bigger than the earth. And the Bible says he held them in his fingers. There are no ears like his. It says the righteous cry and the Lord heareth. It says in Psalm 65, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. You know, the Lord's ear, he hears every believer and every repentant sinner 
in every place, on every island, in every city, in every apartment, in every field, in every jail cell, in every bedroom, in every car, in every church, in every hour, at every point in history. And, and yet his ear is never confused and he is not overwhelmed. You know, have you ever been in a room and, um, you know, there's a lot of background noise and you're trying to talk to somebody and, and uh, we, we often have that at our house. We'll, we'll get a bunch of, you know, family together. And, um, and, and sometimes, you know, we'll have other people there and, uh, you know, I, I found myself, I'm sitting in the living room and I've, I've got somebody, you know, about five feet away from me on the other chair, the other couch. And I, I am trying to focus with everything in me. And you'll notice that as the noise level rises, everybody's voice rises because they all want to be heard and, uh, they're all trying to, you know, communicate and, uh, it gets just a wee bit overwhelming. And that's in one room with less less than 20 people. And yet the Lord hears everybody all the time and his ear is open. And he is never overwhelmed. He never loses track of which voice is which. And he will answer. There is no ear like his. There is no ear like his. Again, Exodus 15, 11 who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? In Matthew 8, the Lord comes to the, uh, the disciples and they're caught in that storm. And uh, the Lord is walking on the water and he comes to them and, and uh, man, he gets in the boat with them and they're panicking and he says, uh, peace be still. And it says, and there was a great calm. And their comment was, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, he literally maketh all things work together for good to them that love God. And when we, we quote that verse, usually we say it in reference to some hard time, some difficult situation, you know, perhaps even a tragedy. And we say, well, you know, the Lord works all things. But you know, it, it, it goes a lot bigger and a lot deeper than that. You know, it says that, the stars in their courses fought for Sisera. Moses and the children of Israel are up against the Red Sea and Pharaoh is behind them and they're caught between two rocky places. And man, there is no way out. And they cry unto the Lord. And the Lord made the Red Sea part for His people. And He made it part instantly. You know, what we're not talking about you know, they didn't have they didn't have a lot of time to play with. In fact, the Lord said he took the, the 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 pillar that he had been leading them with and he went around behind them and he made darkness behind him so that Pharaoh's host couldn't couldn't see and couldn't break through. And suddenly the Lord parts those waters. And the Bible says that the waters became a wall, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The word congealed means made hard as ice. Suddenly those waters part. And you know, people say goofy things. You know, they say, oh, I wonder if the kids stuck their hand in there and, and slapped at a fish or whatever. No, it didn't work that way. Uh, and and I, I saw a picture that somebody, uh, an artist depicted, and uh, it was actually very well done. It shows the people coming down through the depths of the sea. And, uh, you know, remember, we're talking about the Red Sea not um, not the, of this little river somewhere. And as the people descend, there's a wall. Here's these little people in the depths of the sea, and here's the sea, and it's two walls. They're walking through that sea. And not only did that occur, but the seafloor was instantly dry. It says they stepped as on dry land. And then they get to the other side. Finally, the last family's out. And Pharaoh and his army come rushing down in. And the water that parted to save Israel became the death of Pharaoh's army. And it says this about our Lord. He made a way for the ransomed to pass over. And how did he do that? Will the wind and the waves obey him? Who is likened to the Lord? 
Go to Joshua chapter 10. Some of you in this room, you know, I, I think heaven will reveal some things. You know, I remember being a teenager, and many of you could tell stories like this. You know, I remember being a teenager. I was about, uh, well, I wasn't out of high school yet, so I was probably 17, and I was driving my, uh, my mom's car, and we were going to school one morning, and uh, where we lived, the roads were very windy, and it was very hilly, and um, uh, it had been raining that morning, and, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I, I wasn't driving crazy because I had my sister in the car. And um, I was 17. She would have been about 14 or 15. And man, I came around to turn. And on one side was a hilly place in the house. Had I, had I hit that hill, you know, I would have done serious damage to the car. But the other side was a drop. And it was a drop that went 30 or 40 feet down. And there was a creek bed there and a, and a, and a country church tucked away there. And man, I come around that turn and as I turned, I don't know if I turned too hard. And, you know, sometimes when a, when a, when a road is, just has a little bit of water on it, it can make it like an oil slick. I don't know what happened. But all of a sudden, the car just did this. And it just did a total 360. And I'm sitting there. I didn't have time to get scared. And I'm sitting there, stopped. And I'm pointing the right way again. Do you know how many people have done something like that and they went over the side? But that wasn't the only time that happened to me. There's another time I was driving my car, teenager, you know, again, driving on a gravel road, probably driving too fast on gravel. And man, I did another one of those numbers on a, on a country gravel road. You know what? You know, the Lord... Why is it that one person does that and they die? And everybody in the car dies. And somebody else does it and it just spins around and everything's fine. Man, I watched on the highway one, uh, one late afternoon. I was driving uh, down south and I was on the highway and everybody's moving along, a lot of traffic. And this car, a uh, little car, it, there was like uh, three or four lanes and a little car up ahead of me on the left. And man, traffic was moving. They were going 120, 130 clicks an hour. And, you know, I'd always heard this. I always heard if you have a blowout on a front tire at high speed, you know, the danger is that you'll lose control. Man, I saw it in living color. I'm, I'm driving and all of a sudden this car just goes right off it and and the traffic is flying and it misses everybody misses this car as it spins it's shoom, shoom, pew, pew, and and it misses and it lands on the side of the road and everybody's fine do you know how many people die in those scenarios look at Joshua chapter 10 Joshua chapter 10 verse 6 and the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. For I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Ezekiel and then to Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiel and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord. I mean, that was the first miracle. First miracle is God just rains down. God says, you know, Joshua, I'm just going to, I'm just going to help you out here. And the Lord starts dropping huge hailstones out of the sky. 
Verse 12, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. You know what the Lord did? He, he exerted His power to control the wind and the waves and the elements. You know, there's nobody like the Lord. You know, Brother, um, Brother Colburn was here, and you know, he did a great job talking about Joni and the whale. But, you know, again, he pointed out that it was the Lord that sent a whale to help Jonah out. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Yet, as we look at these nature things, we see something else. And that is there's nobody like the Lord in His variety. There's never anything stale about the Lord or anything dry. The Lord is never at a loss. Um, he never has to, you know, sit in a corner somewhere and relax and try to come up with a new idea. He's never running out of surprises. You know, our Lord is known for variety. You know, we try to come up with variety. You ever look at the Lord's variety? Fingerprints. Fingerprints. They say that there's never, ever been two fingerprints alike, which is one of the reasons why they, they fingerprint criminals. Years ago, I remember looking through a book on criminals, and, and, um, and uh, it, you know, these criminals, you know, they, they, they're, they're so smart sometimes that they're not very smart. And um, so these, these, these criminals started taking a knife, and they would cut their a sliver off to kill their fingerprint. Oh, I'm sure that nobody would recognize that fingerprint. <laughs> Let's check him. Oh, he's the guy. Fingerprints. Snowflakes. To this day, God only knows the billions and billions and billions of snowflakes that have fallen, but they've never, ever found any two alike. They've never found any two planets alike. You know, the, the uh, spaceships go out, the, 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 the research ships go out, and they, they take pictures, and, and uh, man, they're always uh, gaining in their ability to examine, and, um, but they've never found two planets even remotely alike. Have you ever looked through a bird book? You, never, you, you ever find that section in the middle where it's called the birds that are all alike? No. My wife is a real bird lover, and uh, she likes to watch the birds that come to the feeder. We've got a few of those in here. And um, you ever notice, did you ever wonder why the Lord did that? Like, you know, he could have just made 10 species of birds and chickens to eat, and then, voila, we're done. <laughs> you know, but, you know, that's our Lord, the fish. Look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, in his variety? Psalm 104, verse 24. Verse 24 says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. Now the word manifold, it's, it's the word many Fold. In other words, it means many faceted, many variations, all sorts. Okay? How manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping. He didn't say swimming. He's just talking about creeping things. Innumerable. He says you can't count them. Both small and great beasts. Did you ever notice the sky when you're driving? You know, um, uh, this time of the year, you know, the, the sky is uh, about the time you're going to church. 
it's um, it's really pretty, and and some of you guys notice it. And and um, we were going to church the other night, and we looked up. My wife said, "I don't think I've ever seen the clouds look like this before." And there they were. You ever notice the variety in the sounds? You know, um, I uh, I have some hunters in my family, and I've went hunting a little bit myself. And, you know, I'm familiar with a deer call. How many of you ladies, ladies, have ever heard a deer call? Uh, come on, ladies. Okay, I see a few. Um, uh, they, You know, deer make a certain sound. And, um, and it's an odd sound, but it's a very small sound. And then, of course, moose, they have their own sound. But then there's an elk. <laughs> My son Micah was really into um, calling coyotes and calling different animals. And, and um, I will never forget the first time I heard the elk sound or the first time I saw an elk make this. I thought, that is the weirdest sound coming out of that body. You know, I can understand if it went, I can understand that. But you know, elks don't make that sound. They make this high pitched. It is bizarre, but it's unmistakable. It's unmistakable. You have coyotes and then you have cougars. You say, what's a cougar do? Oh, they roar. Oh, no, they don't. I saw a video clip just recently. Actually, I've seen two or three. One was of a hunter, and uh, he's out in the middle of the wilderness somewhere, and um, he's taping a cougar screaming. And the cougar sounds like it's maybe a quarter mile away, and it is beside itself with rage. And the, the hunter is an experienced hunter, and he said, he said, you hear that sound? He said, this animal is letting me know that I am an intruder into his land. I saw another clip just the other night, and it shows these two uh, policemen. I think it was a policeman and a policewoman, and they're out there in the dark, in the dark. I, I'm not sure why. I, I surely can't believe they were out there looking for a cougar, but they're out there with their flashlights in the dark, and here's the cruiser. They get about 10 feet from the cruiser and a cougar. Oh, no. The cougar doesn't roar. The cougar screams. Like it sounds like a woman's scream on steroids. <laughs> and it sounds like a very angry woman's scream. <laughs> and it was comical. Both these police officers, bless their heart, they had not been on a diet in a long time. And they're both, they're both doing this. And the cougar goes, I can't even imitate it. The cougar screams. And I mean, they just about fall over each other, running back for the cruiser. Brave souls with their guns. The sounds. Boy, a chickadee call is unmistakable. Um, a raven's call is unmistakable. We got home today, and I could hear the seagulls. Oh, yeah, you, you'd know those with your eyes closed. How many of you ever heard a peacock sound off? Raise your hand. Oh, my, what a sound. I used to be able to imitate it, and the reason I could imitate it was for a while, when I was about 20 years old, we were working on a roof, and we were right beside a peacock farm. And they have the, a very bizarre sound. And it's real nice and loud. <laughs> and, you know, after hours and hours of hearing, or what, you know, I can't even imitate anymore. After hours and hours and hours of hearing peacocks, I could, I could, I could just about do it. You notice how all these things are so different? That's our Lord. Think about the variety in people. You know, if they're right, and I always wonder how they keep track of all this, but they say there's 7 billion people on the planet, and that's just today. That's not history past, and that's not history future. And yet, 
all these people are distinctly different and recognizable. And sure, every once in a while, you'll say, you'll hear, oh, so-and-so and, you know, and their lookalike. But, but even their lookalike is still recognizable. Variety. Look at 2 Samuel 5. There's none like our Lord in his variety. And it even carries over into the way he does things. You know, I've heard it said, and it's really true. You know, um, th there are some things about the Lord that are, are predictable. Like we, we know, the, you know, the Lord rewards certain things. We know how he views certain things. We never know his timing, you know, of how he's going to do exactly what. But there's some things about the Lord that are predictable because we know his nature. And yet, um, you know, you watch the Lord and he solves one problem this way in your life. And you think, oh, if I ever get in the jam, he'll do it the same way. Oh, no, he won't. Oh, no, 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 no. Just about the time you think, I know what the Lord's going to do. That's not what he's going to do. Look at 2 Samuel 5, verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. You know, it just seems like it was just one of those things. You know, David was a very experienced man of war. And I'm sure David had strategies, you know, and David had spies. It was, in some ways, it was probably very typical. You know, David found out, you know, he had men, you know, maybe on a high place because the hold in the mountains and some of that was all in that kind of a place where David had hid for years previously. And so David looks down, he makes a plan, and he engages them, and, and he all he knows is that God is going to work. Maybe God's going to fill their heart with fear. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe... You know, I don't know how God's going to do it, but David just said, you know, God's go we're going to win this battle. And he did. There doesn't seem to be anything unusual about it, in a sense. But look at the next verse. Look at verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim, same place. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, this time, thou shalt not go up. But fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. You know, the second time around, David just didn't assume, oh, you know, it'll be just exactly the same. We'll just pray, ask the Lord to bless, and it'll be the same. He, gets, he goes to the Lord, and he says, Lord, you know, here they are again. And uh, Lord, I just want to ask your blessing. And the Lord says, um, I'm going to let you win again, but this time we're going to do it completely different. Why? Why? Why couldn't the Lord just let David descend into battle again and just let him win again? Well, we don't know why, but we know this. God wasn't going to do it the same. He was going to do it different this time. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. There is none like Him in His power to preserve life. Hezekiah is going to die. Isaiah the prophet tells him, get your house in order. Hezekiah prays, weeps. You know, it reminds the Lord how he had served the Lord. And the Lord said, you know what? He said, Hezekiah, I'm going to let you live 15 more years. He said to Solomon, he said, I will lengthen thy days. In Ephesians 6, he repeats what he'd said in Ephesians 20. You know, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. For this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live 
long upon the earth? You know, the Lord has a way of preserving people's life. You know, that we talked about Caleb this morning, and for 40 years, all his friends are slowly dying off, slowly dying off. Not Caleb. He told the disciples in Mark 16, he said, these signs shall follow them that believe you shall drink any deadly thing. And, and you know, they, they didn't go around looking for jars of kerosene to drink. That, that, that wasn't the point. But the point was that their enemies would try to entrap them. Their enemies would try to do things for them. I, I don't know if this is true or not. We'll find out when we get to heaven. You know, church history is very unreliable in, in those early days, what they call church tradition. But, you know, tradition says that before John was put on the Isle of Patmos, he was put into a pot of boiling oil. Boy, it just never ceases to amaze us the cruelty and the bizarreness of man's attempt to kill and hurt people. Man, you know, if they're going to chop your head off, that's the way to go. Because it's quick. And you're here one moment with the Lord the next. But boy, these lingering, torturous deaths where your enemies are just sadistically staring at you because they love to watch you suffer. And John was put in a pot of oil, so they say. But there was a problem. Nothing happened. So then they said, let's throw him out on the island with the prisoners. You know what the Lord was doing? He was preserving his life. Boy, there's nobody like the Lord that knows how to preserve life. Paul gets stoned to death, they thought. They leave. The disciples are standing around. They're probably weeping. And all of a sudden, the rocks start moving and Paul gets up. Paul gets bit by a deadly snake at the end of the book of Acts. And it says he felt no harm and he shook it off. There's nobody like God in his power to extend and lengthen life. There's nobody that can do that but the Lord. There's nobody like him in, in, in his power to restrain. In Psalm 76, look at it with me, Psalm 76. You know, the more you read this stuff, the more you realize you're, you're on the right side. There's a song I want to I want to copy it. I want us to learn it. And it's called, I'm on the winning side. If God be for us, who can be against us? There is nobody like him. Nobody like him in his power to restrain. Look at Psalm 76, verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. You know, there's something about our God that he, he moves in the affairs of men. And God looks down and um, every once in a while God steps in and he says, okay, you've gone far enough. You're not going any further. You see that in Genesis with King Abimelech and Abraham. You know, Abraham comes into his land and, and he's afraid for his life. And so he says to Sarah, you know, tell him you're my sister. Well, man, he thinks, you know, Abimelech takes her and, and was going to make him one of his wives. And you know what God said? God said, oh, no. God said, uh, you know, no further. That night, Abimelech has a dream. And the God of heaven steps into his dream and says, Abimelech, you're a dead man. He said, you better not touch that woman. She is another man's wife. And Abimelech said, Oh, God, I didn't know. And God says, yeah, I know. I withheld you from sinning against me. You know, it could be a good thing to pray for your kids. God, would you, would you hold them up? Would you stop them? You know, you can't be with them every hour of the day in every place. And, of course, now with the electronic world, it adds a whole new dimension to all of that. And, uh, boy, it would be a good thing to pray that God would interfere in their life. It says in Job 33, God speaketh in a dream that he may withdraw man from his purpose. In Acts chapter 12, Herod had killed James and he took Peter. And it says, intending after Easter to bring him out into the people. He was going to kill him too. But you guys know the story. 
the church prayed, and God sent an angel and let him out of that prison cell. You know what the Lord said? You know, it's, it's went far enough. Look at Psalm 21. Psalm 21. Psalm 21, verse 8. Thy hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. Verse 11. For they intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device which they are not able to to perform. And why is that? It's because God stepped in and said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to let this happen. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? There is nobody like him when it comes to predicting the future. Would you look at Isaiah 46? There's none like him. Isaiah 46, verse 9, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure, declaring the end from the beginning. Verse 9, he said, There is none like me. Look, look at John 13 for a moment. John 13. And look at verse 18. The Lord Jesus says in John 13, 18, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Look at chapter 14, verse 28. Chapter 14, verse 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. You know, the book of Zechariah is really an amazing book. Uh, you know, a lot of those prophets, people that don't read the whole Bible, there's just an awful lot that they miss. 20 times in the book of Zechariah, it says, in that day. And it's about a day that's coming. 20 times, the Lord says, there's a day coming, and he says, in that day. You want to know what's coming? Man, you ought to read the prophets. Look at Jeremiah 33. 33. Jeremiah, 33. Jeremiah 33, and look at verse 14. And by the way, the phrase, in that day, it shows up in several other places in the prophets, or as in this verse, it shows up just slightly different. Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Lord said, uh, he said, there's none like me declaring the end from the beginning. Jeremiah 23, verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their lands. 
and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Verse 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. Now watch. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. In the latter days. You know, and this, this thing of God predicting the future brings us to another truth that walks hand in hand with this one. And that is, there is no one like God to keep a promise. There's no one like Him. You know, people make promises. Boy, what a terrible thing. You know, what are the, what are the most vital promises that ever get made are made at a marriage altar? And you know, there's... There's really no place for vows in our society. And, and to be honest, as I read the scriptures, I know they made them a lot in the Old Testament. Um, but man, you hit the book of Ecclesiastes and, um, and he says, be careful what you say to God. He said, be not hasty to utter anything before God. He says, you don't want to say before the angel it was an error because you, you promised something you can't deliver. And the Lord Jesus comes in the New Testament. He says, swear not at all. He said, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. He said, just let it be enough that you say that you're going to do something. He said, whatever you say you're going to do, follow through. But he said, I'd be careful about making these, these vows. But you know, we, we do have some vows and a vow is a solemn promise. A vow is a solemn promise. And, you know, uh, two people make those vows to each other, and, and um, man, those are some weighty things, or they should be. And, and you know how those vows always close. It says, And forsaking all others, wilt thou keep thou to this man or this woman as long as... Ye both shall live. And you say, I will. They call those the wedding vows. Vows. But you and I both know that, uh, and it's really been going on for a long time, but it's, it's just, we live in a day now where, um, you know, people don't, people don't honor. It's hard to find people that honor their promises. But that's one thing about our Lord is if there's anybody on the planet that's going to keep his promise, it's him. Numbers 23, hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Oh, my soul. We can count on him because he never made a promise that overextended himself. You know, some of us, God, help us. Some of us, you know, we, we you know, in, 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 with best intentions, you know, you signed a note for a loan or, or you, you, you know, you borrowed money from somebody and, and boy, you hit hard times. And I trust that you still tried to pay it, even if it took you longer. But maybe you just bit off more than you could chew. You couldn't see the future. You couldn't see that you were going to lose your job. But you know that's not our Lord's problem. He never looks ahead and sees a, a, a hard part in his bank account. He never looks ahead and goes, whoops, I didn't know that was coming. If he makes a promise, it's, it's going to be okay. 
There's none like him. Look at 2 Kings 7. Do you remember? Do you remember even when the children of Israel, we mentioned it this morning, when God turned them back to wander in the wilderness, do you remember what he said? He said, you shall know my breach of promise. But here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. What was he saying there? Was he saying that, that, that he wouldn't fulfill his promise? He was saying, no, that, that's not what he was saying because he did fulfill his promise. But that first generation wouldn't see it. He was still going to keep his promise. Look at um, 2 Kings 7, verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. We referred to this story this morning. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, tomorrow about this time, that's 24 hours, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. The city was cut off and the Syrians had surrounded it. Verse five, and they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. Boy, you talk about variety. All he did there was make him hear a noise. He didn't need any troops. He said, you know, this time around, let's just, let's just, let's just play with their imagination. <laughs> There's nobody like him. And they said one to another, verse 8, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites. Now their imagination is really going wild. And the king of the Egyptians to come upon us, wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight. From what? Nothing. And left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent, probably ever so cautiously, and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And they came again and entered into another tent, carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will befall us. They, they, they knew good enough to know that everybody inside the city was starving to death and dying, and they're, they're grabbing all this food and hiding it. And they said, you know what? God's going to put a nod on our head if we don't do something right here. Verse 9. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called into the porter of the city, and they told him, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And they called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And you guys know the story. The king is, you know, the king thinks, oh, you know, they're trying to trap us. But he sends out a few people to check. And sure as the world, it's just like the leper said. There's food everywhere. There's money everywhere. There's jewels everywhere. There's clothes everywhere. It's like all the Walmarts went bankrupt. And man, there's just stuff everywhere. Verse 16. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. I mean, they took everything. So... As was predicted, a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. According to the word of the Lord, the Lord had made a promise. And he said in 24 hours, he said, it's going to be wonderful again. And the Lord kept his promise. 
You know why? Did they deserve it? They were under judgment, those Jews. It was a mess. You know what God said? God says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them. I promise. Look at Jeremiah 29. Remember when you were little kids? You know, maybe you guys didn't do this stuff. But, you know, you'd, you'd be going back and forth and you'd be trying to make an agreement with your friend. And, you know, maybe you were in doubt of your friend and he would say, he would say, I promise. I pinky promise. Cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. <laughs> do you remember that? I promise. And was that promise always sure? Nope. But when God looks at you and says, I'm going to do this for you, I promise. Oh, my soul. There's nobody like him. Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. See, Jeremiah's on the, on the beginning of the captivity. He's there when they all get carried away. And the Lord said, but I tell you what, let me make you a promise. It won't go a day past 70 years. See, the Lord's real particular. You know, when the Lord promised the children of Israel would go out, he said, he, he told how many years it would be, and he said, they went out on that year, it said, the self same day. He's real particular about his promise. He is going to keep it to the letter. Verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me and ye shall, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again to the place whence I have caused you to be carried away captive. And you get to the book of Daniel and Daniel lives through all those kings and Daniel's mourning and praying in his captivity. And Daniel gets looking at some books and he realizes he's just about 70 years later. King Cyrus steps into power. And Daniel dies right in that period. And King Cyrus says, who is there of all his people? He says, I want you all to go back to Jerusalem. And 70 years, it's, Daniel said, I understood by books that 70 years were determined. And 70 years had come. And it was right on time. Would you look at 2 Peter 3 for me? 2 Peter 3. Did you know there's nobody like him? Man, if you belong to the Lord this morning, uh, this evening, man, you got, you got every reason to rejoice. You are connected to a God that is so solid and so dependable and He loves you and He has your best interest at heart. And that doesn't mean there's not going to be any bumps in the road, but He will, He will make everything work together for good to them that love God. And if you draw near to Him, He's going to draw nigh to you. And if you call upon Him, He will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. And He's given you a whole bunch of other promises. See, you're his. He's your father. You say, my father didn't keep his promises. But now he's your father. And there's nobody like him. Look at 2 Peter 3, real familiar verse. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He says, you know, the, the Lord hasn't forgotten about his promise. And the whole premise of this chapter is his return. And he said, the Lord is not slack. The Lord doesn't forget. The Lord doesn't get play loose with his promises. The Lord doesn't, you know, just delay because, you know, today, you know, he just decided to take a nap and he doesn't feel like it, you know, and he'll do it later. No, no, he's not slack. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night 
in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things, all the stuff around us, shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Now, now watch. Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise. Why do we look for this stuff? We look for new heavens and a new earth. Why do we do that? Well, he promised. He promised it. And he promised a whole bunch of stuff coming with it. You know, your rewards and your place in the millennial kingdom and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and why should that be a reality to you and me? Because he promised. But it's interesting. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. Knowing this first, it's it, 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 interesting how he puts priority on that. He said, knowing this first. He said, there's something you need to remember. That there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, can I read you verse 4 again? And I just want to emphasize something. These scoffers are going to come and you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, where is the promise? They're going to say, ah, oh, you can't claim that. Ah, oh, that's not for you. Oh, that's not really, really going to happen. That's just, you know, that's just... It'll be spiritual. It won't. And on and on and on it goes. God says, he says, understand that in the last days, people will come and they will say, nah. Why do you believe he's coming? Oh, you're, you've been taught that all your life and all this stuff, you know, but we. And you know what they're saying? Where's the promise? Several months back, it's been almost a year ago now. I had a conversation with somebody and we're sitting together and. And uh, some of y'all remember those days. And um, I sat down with somebody and we were having a lengthy conversation. And, um, and I brought up something God promised. And I mean, it was just, as far as I was concerned, from the, from the verses that I was looking at, and it was very explicit, very clear, mentioned in more than one place. And I said, but God promised this. And here's what he said. I don't think God has to keep that promise. Where is the promise? So, um, you know, this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Boy, I sure hope he keeps that one in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Oh, he made a bunch of promises. I hope he doesn't decide to cancel any of the rest of them. But that's where I realize that my God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent. There is none like him to keep a promise. Well, there's nobody like him. Whether you look at his arm or his fingers or his ears or the forces of nature or variety or preserving life or restraining things or predicting the future or keeping his promises. There's nobody like him. So I want to close with the verse we started, Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help. That's you. And in his excellency on the sky, the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. About the time you just think you can't make it any further, and you fall, you know where you're going to fall? You're going to fall into his arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms. One of the famous missionary ladies uh, of um, years ago, and I, can't, I think it was Hannah Hernard, she wrote a whole bunch of 
of poetry. And she talked about trusting God. And she had a poem that talked about leaping into the abyss. And the abyss is a deep chasm where you can't see the bottom. It's like jumping off a cliff. And she said, I found myself with the Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to go here. And she said, it was a leap into the abyss. And she said, I wrestled. I was afraid to trust him, but I leaped. And she said, I found my feet on a rock. And I found his arms were holding me up. It looked like the end. It looked impossible. But God said, there's nobody like me. Verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine, and his heavens shall drop down the dew. Now I know in the context it's talking about Israel, and you know, they're the Old Testament people of God. But you know, we're making the application, and man, if the shoe fits, and it does. Look at verse 29. You know, in the Psalms, it's as happy as that people whose God is the Lord. Verse 29, happy art thou, O Israel. You know, he said, who is like unto thee, O Lord? Now the Lord says, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord? The shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thine excellency? And thine enemies shall be, shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. He said, you've trusted in me. And he said, I just want you to know that, yeah, there's nobody like me, but, but boy, there's nobody like you either. He said, you're safe. You're saved by the Lord. I am your shield. I am your sword. Your enemies are going to come. They're going to attack you. He says, they're going to lie about you. He says, they shall be found liars. The Lord said, I'm going to stand up on your behalf. And you'll tread upon their high places. God says, I'm going to give you the victory. He said, there's come the day when you'll be on top. Verse 29, who art happy art thou, o Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord. Boy, there's nobody like him. You're his tonight, and he loves you. I don't know what's coming up in your world. I don't know what's coming up tomorrow. I don't know what black clouds you got on your horizon. I don't know what the devil is bringing up from your past. You know, I don't know what's going on. But tonight, not only are you saved, you're safe. Safety is of the Lord. And he looks after his own. And whether he uses his arm or his fingers or his ear, or whatever he does, um, he is with you. He is your God. It says in Psalms, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. And really my point tonight, this isn't really a get right with God kind of a message. That's not what this is about. Um, but you know, we get a lot of things that really get big in our minds some of you came to church tonight. Maybe you got something really big in front of you this week. You got something really big, and it really is big. You know, we've all got those things. I remember years ago, and I closed with this, hearing an evangelist, and he was preaching. He was talking about how he was traveling from church to church, and, and his income wasn't, you know, it was always touch and go. And he said he had his wife, and they were traveling, and they blew an engine in their van. He says, was that the end of the world? He says, was that going to collapse the economy in the U.S.? He says, was that going to close any church doors? He said, no. But he said, but to me, at that moment, he said, it was my whole world. You know, I don't know what's in front of you tonight or what may be in front of you tomorrow. But just remember, if God be for us, I mean, your name's written down, you got a mansion waiting. You've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Just run a little further. And you're going to meet the God who is so big, and yet he cared about you. Let's pray.
Thank you, Lord. Bless your truth. I pray you'd let this be, Lord, a reality to us. I pray you'd help us, Lord, that in the midst of all the things that um, trouble us, Lord, that we would realize that you are our God, and Lord, there's nobody like you, and you ride on the wind. And God, underneath are the everlasting arms. God, I pray you'd help us tonight. May we rejoice in you. Lord, so much of the time, I think for some of us, Lord, we carry a lot of guilt. And we carry a lot of problems. Lord, would you help us, Lord, to cast all our care on you? Because, Lord, you're so big, it's just not a problem for you. Would you help us, Lord, to rest in thee? Lord, would you help us to praise thee? Because, Lord, you have loved us and given yourself for us. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you tonight in the stillness, why don't you talk to him? He knows your name. And he loves to hear your voice. There's nobody like him. Lord, thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.